Hello and welcome to episode number 16 of the Scottish History Podcast. My name is Owen Innes and this week we're going to be starting the story of Mary, Queen of Scots. The story is going to go over probably three, maybe even four different uh, podcasts. Uh, I think I've mentioned before Mary, Queen of Scots' life was full of uh, fun and games, shall we say. Uh, A very, very interesting character from history. So we're just going to basically be starting this episode from her birth up until she comes back to Scotland from France. So basically covering about the first 18 years of her life. And even in those first 18 years, there's a lot of excitement there. So we'll just jump straight into it. So, Mary, Queen of Scots, her real name was Mary Stuart. She was born in Linlithgow Palace on the 8th of December, 1542. Her father being King James V of Scotland, and her mother was a French woman called Mary of Guise. Only six days after Mary was born, James V died. But what of is uncertain? He was not present at Mary's birth or even met his daughter, and he died in Falkland Palace in Fife. His last words, though, were reportedly, it can we alas, it'll gang we alas, which basically means it began with a girl, and it'll end with a girl. Now, what he was potentially referencing there, that's, of course, being if these words were true in the the first place, but he was probably referencing the beginning of the Stuart dynasty, Uh, beginning with the daughter of Robert the Bruce, Marjorie, and technically it did end with a woman, uh, Anne Stuart, that we talked about at the end of the Jacobite period. And Anne was technically the last Stuart monarch to sit on the throne of Britain. Mary was christened shortly after her birth at the conveniently located St Michael's Church conveniently located because it is literally in the grounds of Linlithgow Palace, but it is next door. She was crowned at Stirling Castle on the 9th of September in 1543, and of course, you know, her head was so small that a crown would not fit upon it, so the crown was simply held above her head. Now, as was tradition with such a young monarch, a royal regent was appointed in the shape of her mother. So Mary of Guise became the regent, but there was um, a little fight that went over uh, in regards to that. So there were two other claims to the regency, one from the Catholic Cardinal Beaton, who claimed it was written in the king's will that it should be he who should be regent, but it was dismissed as a forgery. The other claimant was the Protestant Earl of Arran. Now, he was appointed regent for a short time until Mary of Guise managed to have him removed and she took the position herself in 1554. So Mary was the great-niece of the English King Henry VIII as her paternal grandmother, Mary Tudor, was Henry's sister. During Protestant Aaron's tenure as regent, he signed, along with Henry VIII, the Treaty of Greenwich. This was in 1543. This was an agreement that when Mary turned 10 years of age, she would marry the English Prince Edward and move to England. The treaty, however, did state that legally Scotland and England would remain independent from each other, and if they failed to have children, then that union would be dissolved. The Cardinal Beaton's power, however, did rise again, and he resumed preaching a pro-Catholic and pro-French agenda in Scotland, both things that Henry VIII did not like. He really wanted to make the old alliance Scotland had with France broken up. Now, the old alliance, just uh, for clarification, this was talked about in, I think, episode 3, maybe episode 2 or 3, in in fact, when we were talking about the Scottish Wars of Independence that happened in the 13th and 14th centuries. The old alliance was set up between Scotland and France. Basically, it was a way of trying to curtail England in some way. Basically, if England was to invade or attack Scotland, then France would attack England and vice versa. 
So the Catholic Beaton wished to move Mary to Stirling Castle for her own safety, which Aaron initially refused until Beaton showed up with an army. Mary and her mother were moved to Stirling Castle on the 27th of July 1543 and on the 9th of September is when Mary was crowned. This was one of a very small few of Scottish coronations not to happen at Schoon Palace. So just before Mary's coronation, Henry had many Scottish merchants arrested who were bound for France, which caused a major furore in Scotland, and even had the Protestant Arran converting to Catholicism. In the December, the Treaty of Greenwich was rejected by the Scottish Parliament and the Old Alliance was renewed. Henry then began what became known as the Rough Wooing, an eight-year-long war between the two nations to weaken Scotland and to force Mary into marrying the Prince Edward. Mary, during this time, was first sent to Dunkeld, the Fort of the Celts, and then to Inchmahome Priory on an island in the middle of the only lake in Scotland, the Lake of Menteith. Even though Henry VIII died in January 1547, the rough wooing kept on so the Scots turned to the French for help. So King Henry II of France, I suppose it would actually be Henri, but uh, I don't want to embarrass myself. So King Henry II of France agreed for Mary to marry the Dauphin, or the Prince of France, Francis. Mary was then moved to Dumbarton Castle on the west coast of Scotland, from where she sailed on the 7th of August 1548 for France, landing at St. Paul de Leon in Brittany. Mary travelled with her two stepbrothers from her mother's first marriage and a collection of women that have become known as the Four Marys. The Four Marys were four girls, also called Mary, from the four most noble families in Scotland. Their names also make a little rhyme to help you remember. We had Mary Fleming, Mary Beaton, Mary Livingston, Mary Seaton. Mary enjoyed her childhood in France and was generally well-liked. However, Catherine de Medici, her soon-to-be mother-in-law, never did like Mary. Mary was said to be a beautiful young lady and very intelligent. She learned to play the lute and was a good writer of stories and poetry. She was good with horses, falconry and needlework. She also became fluent in French, Italian, Latin, Spanish and Greek, as well as her native Scots language. On the 4th of April in 1558, she secretly signed an agreement with France that if she died without children, that her claim to the Scottish and English thrones will revert to France. On the 6th of April, she was married to Francis at Notre Dame Cathedral, with Francis therefore becoming the King Consort of Scotland. So notice that I said that Mary also had a claim to the English throne. Simply, it is true that Elizabeth I of England was regarded as illegitimate. Elizabeth's mother, who was Anne Boleyn, who Henry VIII had executed, the marriage was annulled, meaning that it didn't happen, technically by law, and therefore Elizabeth was born out of wedlock, or illegitimate, so to speak. Mary was then the next legitimate heir through her grandmother, Margaret Tudor. Henry II of France even went as far to declare that Mary and Francis were Queen and King of England. However, Elizabeth was eventually crowned as Elizabeth I of England. On the 10th of July in 1559, Henry II of France died after a jousting accident and Francis therefore became the King of France with Mary, his Queen. Mary was now Queen of two separate countries at the same time, at such a young age. On the 11th of June 1560, amid, on the 11th of June 1560, amid rising political and religious tensions in Scotland, Mary of Guise died. And six months later, Mary's husband Francis passed away as well, 
leaving Mary no longer the Queen of France. Mary's mother-in-law, Catherine Medici, turned on Mary and shunned her completely after she became the Regent of France. Mary, now with no family in France and hated by their Regent, had only one choice, and that choice was to return to Scotland. So that's where we'll pick up from in our next episode. I just want to first of all thank you all for your patience in waiting for uh, these podcasts to come out. I had three or four recorded and uh, yeah, uh, for some reason I managed to lose every single one of them so I'm having to record them all again. Um, So again, thank you very much for your patience in that and again, thank you very much for the correspondence I've been receiving I welcome it at any time, I'll respond at any time, almost day or night, depending on uh, when I'm working, etc. Uh, but I just want to remind you that uh, if you follow the links in wherever it is that you're listening to the podcast here, you can find links to, first of all, the Patreon page. Basically, the Patreon page is for anyone who wants to donate monthly. You can donate £1 a month or £3 a month, depending on if you can. If you can't, don't worry, these podcasts will always be free. I am going to be starting to perhaps work on some Patreon-only material or perhaps just releasing the uh, the next episode a little bit earlier, but, you know, I'll, I'll work on that and I'll come up with a, you know, a sort of unique angle to it. But I don't want anyone to feel pressured into... Um, signing up for the Patreon whatsoever but for those of you that have um, it has been an amazing response um, you're now um, covering all of my hosting cost, host, hosting costs uh, which was the uh, which was the main idea um, anything else will go towards of course equipment and uh, advertising etc for the podcast so again I do appreciate it very very much um, So if you're listening to this podcast, obviously you're listening on some form of uh, podcast media, but just a little reminder, we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and and on YouTube, uh, if you prefer it in sort of video format. There's no image of me on there, thankfully. Um, But Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, please like um, and rate, leave a little message or whatever on there so that uh, that obviously I can see. If you don't like the podcast, let me know. If you do, let me know. It it, it all makes a difference at the end of the day and it pushes me a little bit further up the ratings and then therefore more people get to hear it. Uh, We're on the socials. So the socials we have Facebook, Twitter and of course just the standard email um, for all of these folks, just so if you're on Facebook, just type in the Scottish History Podcast, you'll find it. Uh, Twitter, the handle is at Scott History Pod. Uh, in actual fact, you can go to facebook.com forward slash Scott History Pod. The email address is Scott History Pod at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram as well, where I've been, it's sporadic but it's every now and then I'll find a, a picture of uh, that I've taken or one that uh, of someone that I know that has taken and with permission I will repost it with a with a little comment on that um, so that gets a nice little discussion happening um, so Instagram as well just Scottish History Podcast or Scott History Pod you'll eventually find me uh, so again, folks, we have the Patreon, we've got uh, the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the email. The podcast website is scotthistorypod.libsyn.com, Libsyn spelt L-I-B-S-Y-N. Uh, so folks, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'm uh, looking forward to the response. I'm also looking forward to putting out the next episode next week so once again thank you very much and i'll speak to you next time